Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. The American Homebrewers Association invites you to celebrate the 24th annual Learn to Homebrew Day on Saturday, November 5th. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to download the official recipe for a small batch hoppy amber ale. Find a homebrew supply shop and dust off your homebrewing skills with how-to videos. Plus, you'll get a promo code for $5 off an annual American Homebrewers Association membership when you make a pledge to participate in Learn to Homebrew Day. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing to get $5 off when you make the Big Brew Pledge by November 8th, 2022. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 13th, 2022. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby, editor of BeerAndGardeningJournal.com and author of the Homebrew Recipe Bible, Methods of Modern Home Brewing, and How to Make Hard Seltzer, joins me to formulate a recipe for a spiced holiday ale. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs and our brewer's logbooks. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook as well. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Financial supporters will see an early release of the next video episode featuring a split batch mead that I did with local honey and tinctures of jalapeno and strawberry. That's a flavor combination that we liked in one of our tincture samplers on this show. Will it be good in the mead bottle? If you're a financial supporter, you'll see this week. If not, you'll see it next week. Upper-tier supporters will also see a behind-the-scenes video of how this mead evolved. Speaking of mead, Steve and I recorded a, a mead up experiment this week with the mead man, Tim Lieber. Tim compared four different types of oak in a split batch of mead. That was a lot of fun and very enlightening. You'll hear that in a couple of weeks. Next week, I'm planning to run the episode that I recorded on a visit to my hometown of Hot Springs, Arkansas as I sat with Rose Schweikart of Superior Bathhouse Brewery in her beer garden right there in the National Park. Uh, two lifelong friends of mine joined us to sample some delicious beers. Rose and her team of now 49 people are knocking it out of the park. The National Park, that is. You'll hear that next week. I've got some good feedback after our dark tincture episode last week. Listener Bill writes, Try mixing the rose hips and the hibiscus tinctures. I've had teas with this combo, then tried them individually. Each one by itself was not flavorful. The combination makes a very nice tea. By the way, rose hips are very high in vitamin C, also known as ascorbic, uh, ascorbic acid. Appreciate that, Bill. Frederick from Sweden wrote, I loved hearing you and Steve do this sampler. It would be great if you find a pink peppercorn and also Seeds of Paradise is a tincture. I'm going to make a uh, gang gangalol tincture after listening to this episode. I had to look that, look that one up. I hope I'm pronouncing it all right. Gang gangalol is apparently similar to uh, ginger or turmeric. Uh, Frederick continues, I would love to hear more about the way Ricky the Mead Maker does mead or did at home. Maybe you guys could make some of their mead at home. I think you said in a few episodes that they share homebrew recipes, and uh, I made most of them, although I change the yeast often. Frederick says, uh, Kvaik Lutra most of the time. Appreciate that, Frederick. That's right. Uh, you can find a bunch of homebrew recipes on Groenfeld.com, and Ricky has uh, written blog posts there on how he makes his meads. goes into great detail. They're very transparent there. Uh, also, take a look at Groenfeld's YouTube channel, and you'll find episodes of Ask the Mead Maker that Ricky has posted uh, through the years. Now, he's, he's too busy to do that nowadays, but uh, there's a lot of good information on the YouTube channel when they were kind of crank, getting cranked up uh, at uh, Groenfeld Meadery. Speaking of our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly of Groenfeld and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont, 
just in time for fall, the ancient collection is together again. It's been a while since Hegir, Vanir, and Bragi have been available at the same time. And now on Gronfell.com, you can find Bourbon Barrel Aged Bragi and Bourbon Barrel Aged Vanir. These are big, beautiful meads, stronger than the Gronfell and Havoc Craft Meads. Uh, Hegir is a cherry mead aged on cherry wood at 13.4% ABV. Veneer is a wildflower honey mead aged on ash, wood, and oak at 15.9%. And Braggy blends wildflower honey with black currants, elderflowers, rose hips. There you go, rose hips again. And a touch of juniper berry. We also tasted juniper berry last week. Uh, Braggy weighs in at 12.5%. ABV. And there's more. Available now for pre-sale is Golden Apple of Discord, a blend of honey brewed with fresh cider aged on white oak. Golden Apple of Discord, available uh, for pre-sale, is at 13.4%. And if you use the case builder when you order multiple bottles of the ancient collection, you can you can save pretty big. So it's time to stock up on big, beautiful honey beverages before the full force of winter is upon us. Check out all the honey-based deliciousness at family-owned and operated Gronfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Okay, let's sit down with Chris Colby and come up with a recipe for a spiced holiday ale. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. We have something new to talk about. Well, so, sort of new. Uh, you uh, are the editor of BeerAndWineJournal.com, and you went great guns on that for a long time, and then you got involved into writing uh, books and things and uh, kind of got d- distracted from the online stuff for a little while. But now you're back at it with a difference, with a little bit of a, of a switch. What's going on? Yes. Well, I uh, uh, back in the day when we started uh, Beer and Wine Journal, it was going to be, uh, you know, a journal of beer and wine. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the people who were going to contribute on the wine side just never materialized. And so it was like beer and, you know, mostly just beer journal, uh, <laughs> which was fine. But it just it had the name wine in it somehow. And so anyway, I. Uh, I've been big into gardening recently, so I thought, well, why not Beer and Gardening Journal? So, yeah, we launched just recently, and so it's now uh, covering beer, most mostly home brewing, but a little bit of general beer appreciation, and also gardening, which is a, it's a mix of vegetable gardening and uh, growing native plants to promote pollinators and attract, you know insects and whatnot and the in all the old articles uh the wealth of information because there's just a ton of stuff uh, on the old beer and wine journal uh site is still on there in fact i think it's it's worked so that if you still have you know bookmarks set for the old site it'll still go to those pages on the new site right yeah the old site uh just redirects to the to the new one yeah so i'm looking forward to that looking forward to uh, to uh, what you've got planted, what you got going. You're always ambitious, especially with the container gardens and the, uh, you know, trying to raise as many monarch butterflies as you can, and and uh, planting poisonous things in your, <laughs> yeah, in your yard. <laughs> so it's so it's something for everybody. Yeah, I got I got some seeds recently for a plant that's like so poisonous that when I started reading up on it. Uh, I started to reconsider, like, do I want this? Because it's like uh, it's, it's monkshood, and it's actually it's a contact hazard. Oh, like the other the other plants, I don't, you know, because I've never had a single person come into my garden and eat any leaves. So, like, you know, it just doesn't happen. But you know, contact hazard that that's different. And it's, I'm trying to either think of if there's some place I can put it and screen it, <laughs> screen it off from from the cats and others. Small dumb animals, and and, uh, and you always you already have such good luck good luck with uh, uh, you know poison ivy, poison oak, things like that. So, oh god, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that was super. <laughs> 
I, I still itch from that. It's been over a month. <laughs> I'm serious. Not wow. not very much. Wow. Not very much. But yeah, I uh, no, it was I was like a week where it was just torture, like just driving me insane. And then it it started fading at in the second week enough that I could I could slap enough hydrocortisone cream on to uh, you know, start to be able to sleep through the night and. You know, and nowadays it's uh, it's a lot better. You know, like my skin's not bubbling and uh, <laughs> that's, that's not not flaking off. But like I had that happen, and uh, uh, you know, I can yeah, I can focus on things without you know having to itch myself. But yeah, <laughs> you should if you live somewhere where poison oak and poison ivy live, you should learn to identify them. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> That and more helpful tips on beerandgardeningjournal.com. Yeah. <laughs> also, get this stuff called Technu. It's, yeah, it, it's anti uh, Urushiol, the, uh, the oil in uh, um, the oil in, in poison oak and poison ivy. Oh, there you go. Uh, I'm lucky in that I don't have to worry about that, but my my wife is not so lucky. So, well, I I might be I might be texting you ask, asking for that name again one day. <laughs> well, we, we're not going to spend the whole time talking about skin irritation. Um, we're to, <laughs> it's starting to get cooler up here uh, in Northwest Arkansas, which means it's going to be time for thinking about holiday beers. And uh, I, I, I've got a wild pumpkin, or it's not a wild pumpkin. It's a domestic pumpkin that volunteered in the front garden. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing like an actual pumpkin beer this year. But I'm not, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a big, uh, chewy, spiced holiday beer. And uh, are you a fan of this style? Um, you know, it's uh, – well – to me, nothing beats Oktoberfest season. Mm. But second to that, you know, a lot of the winter beers, it's fun to have. I used to every year uh, host a, like a when I'd go back home uh, for for the holidays, I, I'd host a, a winter beer tasting, you know, with my friends. And it's 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 interesting. It's not something that I would drink year round. But, you know, when in the winter, um, uh, I think one thing that's neat is the the variety of of different beers at that time of year, you know, the breweries, uh, some of them make the same thing year after year. Others of them have, you know, it's a new, you know, like anchors that has a different, uh, different formula every year. And you know, they're, they're interesting. I like, I like generally like them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you do them right, um, like my, my fruitcake barley wine is probably not a good example. Because it's mm. it's pretty intense. <laughs> it can be delicious, but it's not you know it's not very quote unquote drinkable. You know, uh, about half a pint is probably all you want uh, from there. Uh, but you know, because it's got fruits and spices and and uh, you know uh, molasses and brown sugar and and everything that's in a a fruit cart a fruit cake goes in the barley wine. Uh, and you know, people have sent us homebrew examples that they've made. And they can be delicious. In fact, I think just about every example that I've been given by other brewers has been better than mine. So, <laughs> mm. uh, so, um, but but I I don't think we're going that heavy with this with this one, right? I mean, we're not we're not trying to uh, uh, mimic liquid potpourri. Yeah, I think what what we talked about was was something that you know you might call like either a holiday beer or a winter warmer. Or or something like that. So, you know, a big beer, but not like uh, not like a barley wine, not like barley wine big. So what what are the what are the stats like? I mean, what are we what are we looking at? Give a, give us a a picture by the numbers of this beer. Well, the the nice thing about it is you can brew, you know, whatever you want. If you look at commercial examples, uh, different holiday beers are you know they range from pale to dark. Uh, generally a little bit stronger, uh, sometimes, or probably more often than not spiced. Uh, but the, I mean, it, it runs the gamut from sort of, uh, you know, relatively large ish amber ales to, uh, things that are definitely stouts to things that are definitely very, uh, you know, very spicy, you know, that's the spice really stands out to others that are 
more like it tastes like beer, but there's, you know, just a little hint of spice in it. So you really, um, I, I know it's really the, the sky's the limit. I mean, I think the the key defining factor would be just slightly higher alcohol than usual, like in the, in the seven to eight percent range. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not talking about a 10 to 12 <laughs> percent, you know, thick, you know, uh, 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 big old, um, Oh, Scotch ale or something like that, or uh, Scotch. No, ale. or like, or like Sammy Claus, the uh, the heaviest, or, or was once the strongest beer in the world, I, I believe, at fourteen percent, way way back when. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that's a, a seasonal uh, Christmas lager. Um, but no, I, I was thinking more like uh, uh, very roughly in the uh, in you know the uh, ballpark of like an anchor. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank our Christmas. So uh, not not quite a barley wine, but sort of a a, a younger co- younger more fit cousin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and I, I I'm planning to actually brew this beer. Uh, so you're you're going to go. You've got your brewing software there. Uh, your mm-hmm. your spreadsheet, and yep. we're going to actually build this beer from scratch. Um, and let's talk about the technique. I want, I, w- I want this to be a a two gallon batch because mm-hmm. I you know I don't want you know five whole gallons or nineteen liters of you know something that's uh, going to wind up in the back of the fridge after the holiday season and, <laughs> and not get consumed. Uh, you know I want this to be something special, something fairly limited edition that maybe I can give out a few as, as Christmas presents or whatever. Uh, so let's let's shoot a target volume of of two gallons. There's two gallons. Okay, let me uh, put that in the in the gunkulation device. <laughs> You'd think I would know my own spreadsheet. There we go. <laughs> there we go. And then, uh, what do you think for an ABV? Like eight? Eight? Is that too high for what you're thinking? Eight is great, I would say. Eight is great. <laughs> eight is great. Let's go. Let's go with eight. Now, what are the what are some strategies if we're you know that's still a fairly fairly high alcohol beer, you know, so we're going to have to have a bunch of sugar to get up there. So, in a batch like this, what are what's in? Remember, I'm doing brew in a bag, right? Um, so. What are your what would be your strategy to get that original gravity that we're looking for in that two gallon batch? I would I, if I was using brew in a bag, I would uh, make it so you make enough wort for a one hour boil and then add malt extract uh-huh. to uh, rather than uh, you know for eight uh, percent you would you would need to collect a decent amount of wort and boil it for a while if you wanted to uh if you wanted to really get everything uh that possible out of your uh out of your grains but um if you you know uh go smaller just get get everything you can out of your grains and then just add malt extract uh it's you know it's not gonna be harmful on a, a beer like this malt extract the one of the usual criticisms of it is that it's not – it makes wort that isn't quite as fermentable as all-grain wort. Uh, but however, when you mix it with all-grain wort, the, any enzymes in there are going to are, are go to act on it. And also this is this is a beer where we – you know, we aren't looking to make like a super – you know, it's not 8% and super, super dry. It's going to be, you know, uh, uh, you know, not – hopefully not – cloyingly sweet but you know it's gonna it's gonna finish at a, at a reasonably high final gravity just because it starts at a, at a high original gravity and you know uh if it if it's not you know just dry 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 that's fine that's good even and i think that it, it depends on what brand of of malt extract you use uh some yeah. are some are more fermentable than others uh i think that the um you know i'll most likely use something like a, a Breeze's pills and light dry malt extract and that's that's pretty fermentable. Yeah. Um so it's not something I think 
and I might be misremembering, but I'm thinking like the Cooper's uh, extract that I've used in the past is not as fermentable. Um, maybe I'm lying about that, but but you know, keep that in mind. And maybe there's there's some stats out there on on fermentability of of different uh, malt extracts that you would use. Uh, some of those, you know, quote unquote, can and a kilo mm. kits, you know, uh, the the malt extract is not very fermentable because it's you're it's meant to be blended with sugar, uh, you know, which dries out the beer, and you know the the balance of those two is meant to to. Uh, uh, you know, counteract each other. Whereas if you put it in a, in an all malt beer, you know, or all malt extract beer, or mostly, then the the fermentability can be a problem. Right, right. Especially with a big beer. Yeah. Okay. So, so what what base malt should we start out with, and how much? Well, I would start with the if you're going to make a, a dark beer, I'd start with the uh, the dark grains first. And then sort of once you have that those figured, then just add the add the base malt on top to, to get where you want. Hmm. Add it up. Like I would I would start with uh thinking about the, the dark grains and specifically like do we want to do a blend of dark grains? I, I for some reason I always like doing a blend of them. Mm-hmm. Uh or or do we want to just, you know, uh the chocolate malt or or just some other malt? It seems like theoretically you'd get a deeper uh, sort of character, flavor characteristic if you did a blend. Um, whereas, you know, but on the other hand, through our uh, malt sampler series, Steve and I have tasted some really good beers made with just, you know, a base malt and, uh, you know, one specialty grain on top of it or one specialty malt. You know, so you can't get too fancy, but um, – is in the amount of these, since it's a bigger beer, do we want to up the amount of those specialty malts? Like I say, if you're, you know, if you're making like a 10 per, 10% barley wine, do you add twice as much dark uh, grains or dark, dark malts as you would say a 5% beer? I don't. I mean, I think it's the, the intensity of the, uh, the dark grains is going to be at least roughly the same no matter what the uh uh original gravity is maybe you know maybe the the slightly bigger beers mask it a little bit bigger but i usually go with uh with a couple exceptions i made a 15 percent stout one year and uh i went on 10 percent five years before that uh and those had more grains and it's it's a different kind of beer than you know. It's it's like a very super roasty beer. Mm. If you add more, yeah. For for winter warmer, I would add sort of in the ballpark of what you would add for like a stout or a porter. And and also with uh, when you got to think about crystal malts, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you don't want to add a bunch more of those because if it's a high gravity beer. You're probably going to be finishing finishing with a higher gravity at the end, anyway. And if you add a bunch more crystal malt, that's going to make it even more chewy or even sweet if you're not careful. Right, and combined with the fact that we're already but we're going to be using some malt extract, we just don't need you know something else pushing uh, pushing the wort to be less fermentable. Um, you know, some crystal, uh, you know a big sort of dark malty beer. Some crystal's going to be good, but I, I would go with sort of a smaller amount of a, of a more darkly killed version than, you know, than like I say, like a whole pound of crystal 40 or something, which right. it, to me would be too much yeah. for the five gallon. Right. Whatever that scaled down to two. Right. Yeah. I think, although, uh, um, Matt Giovanisi did uh, brewed the American Amber Ale that he and I uh, formulated together, and he used mm-hmm. a, a pound of crystal malt in his five gallon batch, or four hundred fifty grams in in nineteen liters, and it didn't turn out too sweet. So, uh, you know, it, it just it, I guess it just depends on on the recipe. It depends on the beer, right? And that's starting at you know what ten forty eight or ten fifty or you know yeah. something like that, rather yeah. than. Uh, ours will be if it's eight percent. It's it'll be you know around in the neighborhood of ten eighty for starters. I'm going to be honest with you. 
I'm not planning to brew this holiday beer on my Warthog electric system from our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com. Two gallons is just too small for my half-barrel system, but for five or ten-gallon batches, I love to brew with my system with the Warthog EBC-130 controller. It's taken the pain out of propane for me. No more wrapping my mash tonner kettle with blankets of towels to try to maintain my mash rest temper in the wintertime. My Warthog controller holds the mash temperature rock steady. And for the boil, the winter winds no longer blow the heat away, thanks to the Blickman boil coil in my kettle. I do brew in a bag, but Dave makes Warthog systems in single, two, or three vessel configurations to fit your needs. And if you have a question or, or an issue with your Warthog system, Desiree and Dave will make it right. You can contact them directly because Dave puts these things together right there at High Gravity in Tulsa. Steve and I love our Warthog systems, and you will too. And if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. So what do we start with? How do we pick out, you know, if we're starting with the dark grains, what are your favorite ones to, to pick for something like this? Or something like this, an, an obvious one would be chocolate malt. Mm -hmm. And I, I would go with something about like maybe maybe 11 or 12 ounces for a, a five-gallon batch. So well, what would that be for two gallons? <laughs> let's, let's say 12 ounces, 12 ounces times two divided by five equals okay that's a little bit less than five 4.8 ounces of, of chocolate malt and maybe um i don't know something else to just round that out uh we could go with a little bit of a a little bit of roasted barley like the stout thing that would that would give a, you know um because the, the chocolate should have some some roastiness to it mm -hmm. uh but the roasted barley would give a, a little coffee like uh, roast to it. Or there's also, I don't even know if they sell it anymore, uh, kiln coffee malt, malt. Do you remember that? Huh. It, it's like supposedly, and I, I thought did uh, mimic coffee a little bit. Hmm. Now, we don't want to get too fancy because what. <laughs> My my yeah, local homebrew store my local homebrew store is kind of small and you know the, you know they they stock the uh, the main things but uh, you know we we can't get 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 too fancy uh, for the local local folks. Um, what about okay. what would you so let's go with what, what would you think about black oh, patent? Go ahead. Sure, um, that's going to add a lot of color. Uh, it's not going to add a lot of flavor or aroma, which is fine. Um, it adds a, in, in, in my memory, it adds a little bit of sweetness. Even uh, people people think it's ashy or it's you know acrid or something like that. But in our tastings, it, yeah, it hasn't right. been. Um, I don't know. I just okay, it, so, it, it, it may be it, it may be too dark for what you're for what you're thinking of. Know, let's go with uh, let's go with four ounces for for a two gallon batch of uh, chocolate malt and an ounce of black patent. Okay. I mean, when you said rounding okay. out, that black patent came to my mind of something that might, round, you know, sort of yeah. ironic, ironically round out the roastiness. Yeah. Okay. And that gets us just those two malts alone get us to an SRM of about thirty. So we're we're in the solidly in the dark beer range there. Okay. Should we even worry about crystal malts at this point? So it's up to you. <laughs> you're the one brewing it. <laughs> but I mean, uh, but you're the expert. You're the author of the homebrew recipe Bible. You know, you're. A... <laughs> I, just... I would put in a, a, a very little crystal 60. Okay. Like maybe, maybe even just two ounces of crystal 60. That'll give us a little copperish, orangish uh, color in there. Uh, to add. Your, yeah, and your homebrew, your homebrew store will love you. <laughs> like thirteen grains of crystal malt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, thirteen and a half. Can you saw one of those crystal malt kernels in half? 
just just wave the scoop of Crystal 60 over the grain bag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't let any fall in. Just let the essence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the essence of the Crystal 60 go in there. Um, okay. And what, are we ready for base malt? What base malt would you would you go with? Yeah, a base malt. I mean, a good thing for this. It sort of depends on the 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 va- You know, it it depends on what you're shooting for. Um, given that, I I would see a lot of a lot of these winter, at least the ones I like, are sort of you know sort of English ale type things. So for me, like a British pale ale malt would do good. Uh, or, um, you know, sort of a blend of, uh, Pilsner malt and some Munich, Mm. um, either, either one of those would do good. Or, you know, you could add a, you know, pale malt, Pilsner malt, something like that and add, you know, either a little bit of like aromatic malt or, or what's that other melanoid malt, which are, you know, sort of like strong Munich malts. There's, there's a lot of. What about just pale ale malt? That that's great. Everyone loves pale ale malt. Sure. Now Everyone is that loves pale. now is that would would uh, Maris Otter classify as as an English pale ale malt? Yeah, uh, I mean Maris Otter is a variety of barley, and when it is malted, it's usually male, malted into pale ale malt. Um, so yeah, Maris Otter would work. Not to be cliche, <laughs> it <laughs> seems like whenever I want to get fancy on the base malts, I go to the Maris Otter. <laughs> Although the, uh, Matt used Maris Otter for his American Amber Ale, and it turned out really nice. It had a really nice malt character. If we add five and a half pounds, again, this is for the two-gallon batch, five and a half pounds to the other malts that we already have with, uh, let's see, 75% extract of finish C. That puts us at an OG of 1084, a projected uh, at 75% attenuation, uh, and an FG of 1.021 for an ABV of 8.1. That's now, pretty good. Are you forgetting the uh, uh, the extract? Oh, I certainly am forgetting the extract. <laughs> here's the thing. Let's see. How much? Do you like a pound of... Brees, pills and light, dry malt extract. If you're gonna if you're gonna make two gallons, what would your pre boil wanna be? Yeah, that's Probably a question something. that's a question that I was thinking. I mean, initially I was thinking I would add a bunch more water and have to boil down. Uh but this is just kinda like a standard volume or starting volume because it's it's just gonna be a you know, it's, it, I'm not going to have to mash with a whole bunch of of grain, proportionally. Right. It looks like with a with the full five and a half pounds, you you would need a, a roughly two gallons of strike water, and then you would, after mashing, you would want to add more. Uh, you would want to add, you know, the, the what passes for the sparge water. Like for a five gallon batch, I usually start out, you know, or nineteen liter batch, I usually start off with eight eight gallons of water in the mash or thirty liters. So I don't add wow. any more. I don't add any more water during the process. Right. So it's a thin mash, and then you end up with. Okay, let me try something. <laughs> I might want to get my brewer's logbook and look in, at some past batches. Hey everybody, this is James from the future. I looked at some previous uh, batches of this volume, and it looks like I started off with three and a half gallons of water, or 13.25 liters in the kettle before I mashed in the grain. Okay, if we if we went with for for the two gallon batch, four pounds of pale ale malt, uh, the quarter pound of you know, four ounces of chocolate malt, the, you know, like the one ounce of black patent malt and the, the two ounces of crystal malt, uh, and add a, add a, uh, add a pound of dried malt extract that gets us 
1085 OG, 1021 Final Gravity, uh, and an 8.2%. That's oh. pretty good. Yeah. And then, yeah, you should be able to hit, uh, you should be able to mash so that you yield about three gallons, boil it down to two, and in the last couple of minutes, uh, stir in the malt extract. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, that'll work. Yeah, that sounds good. So I'm assuming we're not we're not going to spend a lot of effort on hopping. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not going to the style. Well, it's not really a style, but the the sort of general dark roasty winter beers aren't uh, usually. You know, there's there's not a lot of late hops in it. There's not you know a ton of hop aroma and and, fl- and flavor. Uh, they are generally, I mean, because they're a little bit stronger. Uh, they they do have some hop bitterness though. Right. So yeah, I would I would go with some sort of neutral high alpha hop, and for an eight percent beer, uh, I don't know. I would shoot for at least thirty five IBUs, maybe forty. Okay. Okay, so let's. What's a good? Uh, something like Magnum. Magnum. That's like, that's like sixteen, isn't it? Or is it twelve? What's the? I don't know. I haven't system? used I haven't used Magnum in a while. I'm just gonna put in twelve, and we'll say find a find a neutral high alpha hop around twelve, and there's got to be a ton of them. And for a sixty sixty minute boil. Yeah, for sixty minute boil, it looks like. I always like to use whole ounces, <laughs> just because I don't like <laughs> little leftover bags in the freezer. <laughs> okay, if you went with a third of an ounce, uh, or a little less than nine and a half grams, that gets us a thirty-seven IBU, which mm. is pretty good. If you and hang on, if you just dumped in the whole ounce, that gets us to a calculated of. Let's see, blah, 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 roughly 100 IBUs. <laughs> it's a little, it's a little much. <laughs> Winter doesn't need to be that bitter. <laughs> what about, what about, uh, oh, I wish I had my little bag of sots here. What about something like, uh, you know, like a moderate, like like a 4% four, 4% uh, alpha acid hop? I could get away with a, a whole ounce of that, right? Because, I mean... Proportionally, well, let's see. Uh, I if, I, if I'm doing so. a if I'm doing a third of an ounce of a of a twelve, yeah, a full ounce at uh, four is, is the same IBUs calculated out. Yeah, I might go that direction. Okay, given the the words a little bit thicker, your you know the IBUs might be a little lower than the the straight calculation, but. Uh, not by a ton. So what? What spices? I mean, if we if we stray too far, we'll we'll be making a pumpkin spice beer, and I know how everybody loves those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was I was thinking I this I was reaching for stuff in the pantry today, and I saw some some Old Bay seasoning. And I was like, huh, <laughs> I wonder what that would be like in a beer. Is it, I'm not, I don't know if I'm familiar with bay seasoning. Isn't that like spicy? It's like, a, it, well, it's a, hot spicy. It, it's, it's usually used in like seafood, um, you know, old bay seasoning for like crab, oh, okay, crab yeah, boils yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah, I know crab boil seasoning. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. I mean, uh. Uh, that would be a beer that people either loved or hated. <laughs> I don't know. I might smell it and see what uh, see what we're talking about. But what I, I guess it depends on what what spices uh, I would choose. But first of all, where where would you add spices in the in the process? Well, that's a good question, uh, and a, a little bit dependent on what the spice was. I mean, uh, the the two. Best choices are add it right at the end of the boil. Um, then you you know you volatilize the 
uh, a lot of those essential oils in there, but you don't uh, blow them completely off. Um, uh, so they're, they, they're in the work. Uh, the second option, and, and one that I prefer generally, is adding it after fermentation. Mm. Um, you can take take like an empty, an old empty spice jar, uh, if it's glass, and wash it out really good. And put whatever spice you wanna uh, you wanna use in the in the beer in there, and then just pour vodka over it and let it sit for about three days. Oh. And then you make like a tincture. Yeah. And you can. The nice thing about this is you can, you know, depending on how technical you want, you can like take a pint of your your beer and like add, uh, you know, drop by drop to the uh, to to the pint of beer, and then. You know, when you get to a point where, yeah, I like that spicing level, you, then you have, you know, a, a drop, which is, a, I forget, it's a standard size, though. Uh, you know, that many drops in that many ounces of, of beer, and then, you know, you calculate well, how much would I need to to dose my full, uh, you know, full amount of beer. Yeah. Minus, Steve minus and I, the pint that you pulled out. Steve and I have been doing a lot of work with tinctures lately, and we've got these these little the little plastic pipettes, you know, where, oh, you, can, nice. where yeah. you can like measure, you know, up to three milliliters. Um, and I actually used that technique to, um, to flavor a mead, uh, for an upcoming video video show. And, uh, I used, uh, a bit of jalapeno tincture and a mm -hmm. bit of strawberry tincture in that same mead. And what I did was, uh, you know, at, at bottling time, it was a small batch, so I had it my little Mr. Beer, you know, plastic keg fermenter. But I took, you know, and and just squirted, <laughs> squirted tincture in there until I thought it was good enough, and I stirred it around, and I gave it a little taste. And uh, you know, I added, a, I, I wound up adding a lot more strawberry than I did the uh, jalapeno, obviously. But mm -hmm. I, that way, you know, I could I could wind up with a perfect flavor, or at least what I thought at the time. Uh, you know, really good balance of flavors. That would be a great approach for this. Uh, that way yeah. I could add things in the bottling bucket and taste it and not be, you know, overwhelmed. That's Yeah, I think that's that's the way to do it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it's – you can add spices to the boil, um, but once you once you do that, it's – your your level of spicing is set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you, you could add more if you wanted later. But you can't take any away, and with a with a post ferment, you can't take it away once you've added it. But you can you can figure out how much you know this this much uh, tincture to this much of a of a beer you know gives you know what level of flavor you want, and, and then and, and what we what we may want to do, Steve and I may want to do like a holiday spice tincture show if we haven't already. I'll have to. <laughs> My memory is not what it used to be. I'm 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 blaming COVID haze, uh, <laughs> uh, but but you know we could we could figure out using you know a small batch. I've got this little dark beer that I made specifically for this purpose, uh, and we could we could come up with some nice holiday spice combinations in tinctures, and uh, you know use that in the uh, in this beer. That'd be a fun. Sure, it'd be a fun thing, and we'd get another show out of it. So. Um, so I'm assuming with a big beer, you want to pitch the right amount of yeast. Yeah. Um, so you'd, you'd want to make a appropriately sized uh, yeast starter for only a two gallon batch. Uh, that's, that's not going to be hard. I mean, some of the some of the modern packages give yeast might even be big enough for that. And you would, you know, when you're selecting your yeast, you would also want to think about uh, alcohol tolerance. You know, clearly, um, I mean, 8% is, you know, most beers should uh, or most beer, uh, you know, yeast strains should be able to easily go up to 8%. But, uh, you know, they're going to the, the higher the alcohol tolerance, the, the you know, the, the faster they're going to work mm -hmm. uh, even at 8%. And then you also have to sort of de decide, you know, and this would go along with. You know, it's a dark, roasty. You got to decide with spice. Do you want 
uh, a little bit of that, you know, ale ester estery, you know, like a, like an English ale character, hmm. or do you want do you want to go with an, a neutral American, um, you know, like I I sort of think for if your spicing level, if you're he- heading for a spicing level of, you know, like this tastes like beer, but I can tell there's a little bit of spice into it. Uh, an English ale yeast would be nice because I don't have the the ale flavor and 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 I'll round it out. If you're heading more for uh, like this is you know the spice is like the 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 you know the forward the most prominent flavor, uh, then I'd probably go more with a, a neutral American strain. That's interesting. I haven't used an English yeast in a while. Um, two two hundred billion cells would probably be enough to ferment this, <laughs> leading into a commercial for Imperial. Uh, <laughs> I would think that a pa- that a packet of uh, you know two hundred billion cells of, of an imperial say juice maybe which I think I think juice is a uh, an English strain, um, you know maybe maybe that would do be strong enough without a starter. Um, yeah, I might have to. I, I'm I'm leaning toward maybe an English strain rather than just a clean. Uh, you know, American strain, uh, because I just I tend to lean toward you know the the Chico strain or the flagship or you know the the plain right. plain old American yeast a lot. Uh, so yeah, I might especially around the holidays. You know, you think of Dickens and you know <laughs> English <laughs> English uh, uh, you know imagery of uh, Christmas and things like that. Um, and yeah, and the last thing you'd want to think about yeast wise would be the attenuation. Like, uh, there are, uh, you know, English ale yeasts sort of run the gamut from, from very, very dry, like, you know, the, the strains that are reputedly, you know, from derived from the, the Whitbread strain make fairly dry beers. Uh, and whereas like the, the strains that are, you know, reputedly from Fuller's, uh, you know, make beautiful beers, but they they quit quit fermenting and drop out a little bit earlier, leaving a slightly higher uh, uh, finishing gravity. So you might want one. It's either either sort of normal, quote unquote, normal attenuation, or even a slightly slightly drier, hmm. especially with the the malt extract. Yeah, uh, you know, sort of counterbalance. You know, some some factors pushing it. Uh, to be less fermentable wort and, you know, uh, some factors, you know, pushing to, to ferment the wort more completely. So I'm still deciding which English yeast to use on this beer. But, you know, it's going to be from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. Looking at the stats on imperialyeast.com, I'm deciding between Imperial A01 House, which has a listed attenuation rate of 73 to 75 percent, and AO9 Pub with an attenuation rate of 69 to 74 percent. I'm leaning towards the pub. Uh, With 200 billion cells per easy-to-open package, it's a winner either way. I like to say my stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore to make starters for moderate gravity five-gallon batches, and my airlocks are usually bubbling before bedtime. And be on the lookout for gluten-free A40GF bubbles. Speaking of bubbling... For ciders, uh, if you like ciders as much as I do, Bubbles has a very clean flavor profile and allows the nuances of the fruit to come through, and it's produced on 100% gluten-free media. Ask your local homebrew store about A40GF from Imperial Organic Yeast and check out all the other wonderful strains at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. And and this theoretically, if I do it right, this may be a beer that that might survive, you know, say being laid down, say for a year, something like that. It could be, uh, yeah. I tend to think, you know, it's it's sort of a, a almost taken for granted in homebrewing that larger beers age better than than uh, you know smaller beers, less strong beers. I, I don't know if I necessarily believe that. I've I've had a lot of aged beers that were just god f- awful uh, <laughs> you know and and a, a lot of times 
a lot of times people bring them out at the end of a tasting. Like you'll you'll taste a bunch of normal beers and this oh, I've got this stuff I've been you know, and, and by that time everyone is, you know, polluted and uh you know, so of course the beer tastes good, you know. It's like yeah. <laughs> it's really hell uh, wow. <laughs> this is more alcohol. That's just what I was wanting right about now. Yeah. <laughs> But if you, you know, if you were to taste it, like this would be, you know, your first beer that you tasted of the day. And, and, you know, particularly a lot of those older ones, if you smell them, they just smell oxidized. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, I think aging of beers is, is something that's kind of flaky and hasn't really been figured out. You know, um, some, some beers do age pretty well, uh, and others don't. And I, you know, I, I think Higher alcohol beers are more likely to age well, but I, I don't see high alcohol as, as a guarantee that, that they will age well. That would be a fun experiment. I also think, and this is more of an opinion than a anything purporting to be a fact, but I, I think a, a dark beer, if it's well made, has a little bit better potential to age well than a, than a pale beer. I agree. Yeah, because the caramely notes, especially from a dark beer, um, you know, roasty caramely notes tend to turn more into kind of toffee, you know, or or something uh, yeah. that kind of pairs well with a little bit of oxidation. Whereas if you're trying to age, you know, like a hoppy American IPA, it ain't going <laughs> to – number one, the hops are going to fade, and that's what you – what about the beer – uh, but then also, you know, that in the lighter malt bill, that that oxidation, that cardboardy sherry notes are going to be more noticeable and distracting. Yeah, the in in some beers, you at least some people claim that they they want a little bit of that sherry character that can come uh, from a, one kind of oxidation. But yeah, I've never heard anyone try to say that. Uh, the cardboard, you know, that <laughs> what is that trans to no 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 like I can't remember, but whatever. Uh whatever the the molecule is, yeah, nobody wants that. I'm I'm gonna step out there and, and say something that some people may well, most people probably will disagree with, but I like Bigfoot barley wine fresh. And people keep mm-hmm. doing vertical tastings of Bigfoot barley barley wine and I've I've been in on some of those and I'm just like, you know, just give me this stuff right out of the tap. I just, <laughs> the fre- <laughs> give me the fresh stuff because the hops are so big and beautiful and and fresh and and uh, you know you just get the older ones and it's like, yeah, that's like syrup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, but mm. anyway, that's that's my unpopular. Yeah, I've I, I've had some. Uh, uh, some barley wine verticals and specifically Bigfoot. And it's, it's kind of amazing how, and then also sometimes I think these verticals were composed of different people bringing different beers from different. So the storage might've differed, mm, yeah. but, but sometimes something can be a few years old and you're like, Hey, that's still pretty good, you know? And then the year younger, which you would, you'd think would be even better because it's a little bit where you're, you're just like, Ooh, that's, that's done. <laughs> <laughs> put a put a fork in it. That's yeah. That's no good. Maybe you shouldn't have kept that in your trunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially in Texas. Yeah. So, so, so it spent the whole summer at like 140 degrees. <laughs> I wanted to make sure around. nobody drank it, so I kept it in my yeah. trunk. In back of my pickup. <laughs> I hid it in the engine compartment. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. What what else? Is there anything else that? Uh, and you can you can send me. Can you send me the recipe? Or I guess I, I could transcribe it from the uh, thing, but that you know, it'd be too much work for I, me. It's got it right on my little gonculator here. <laughs> yeah, uh, about the only thing I would say, I used to judge when I when I was a homebrew judge frequently. I I didn't really mind uh, judging the spice beers, so you know, a lot a lot of judges don't like that, and so I ended up with the shivs a lot. The spice or vegetable was the Mm. what they called it at the time. And one thing I would say from from brewing or tasting a lot of those is that the ones that had a laundry list of spices almost always just tasted muddled and gross. Oh. Okay. Like um 
I would really say if you're gonna if you're gonna make a spiced beer, stick either with you know like a, a single spice can be awesome. You know, like in a in a winter warmer, something like a, just a hint of cinnamon mm-hmm. uh, can be really good. Or if, if you don't go with a single spice, at least pick a combo that shows up somewhere in cooking. Like, you know, uh, don't just go to your you know your spice cabinet or your wife's spice cabinet and and just start dumping things in <laughs> and, and also I, I i really think you know i mean when you brew er, all, everything your your malt should be fresh your your know, hops it should be fresh like that but in the spice beer it really shows up um your your, your spice should you know i i would really just if you're gonna if you're gonna put the time and effort on a batch go get a, a fresh vial of fight spices mm-hmm you know, unless you cook up it enough that you really have a good idea of, because yeah. if you if you dump in old spices, uh, or, or old spice, the uh, <laughs> you'll turn into a horse. The, the deodorant, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if you if you dump in uh, spices that are less fresh, you'll you'll need to use more to get the flavor you want. But then you'll get a lot of vegetal. You know, you're you're dumping in more plant material to get the the oils that you want, and so. Pick something that's, uh, you know, as fresh as possible and use as little of it as you, you can rather than, you know, you know, using rather than using, you know, uh, two teaspoons of something that's old. Try to use one teaspoon of something that's, you know, fresh. Yeah. And you're, you're going to be much, much happier. Good advice. Well, all right. I'd say, yeah, like I say, I'm going to I'm going to brew this up. And then when I when I do, I'll if it's good I'll send you some. Cool. And if it's bad I'll send you all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for formulating a crappy beer, Chris. <laughs> yeah, this is for you. Yeah. <laughs> Take this to your own brew club meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Well, uh, we're, we're lo- looking forward to uh, to all this, all the good stuff coming on the the new and improved beer and gardening journal dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll see if you poison. Well, I, I was going to say we'll see if you poison any of your neighbors, but that, <laughs> that might end up in evidence in court one day. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to poison anybody. That's that's not the. <laughs> it's not the reason to grow poisonous plants, but it can be fun to think about sometimes, but <laughs> thinking about stuff is perfectly fine. Doing it so, may be a felony. So far. <laughs> yeah, so far. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, James. Thanks again to Chris. I want to get my ingredients soon to start this beer. And I need to get together with Steve to pick out the spices for the tinctures that I'm going to use. That that should be fun. That'd be a fun show. Be sure to check out beerandgardeningjournal.com to follow Chris's adventures in beer and gardening. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. So long.